Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, we have the opportunity, and I'm very honored to be in, sitting in this table right now uh, with these amazing uh, cryptographers and people. Um, so cryptographers and people. <laughs> <laughs> Some, yeah, some, some, some cryptographers. Some, 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 some people. Some people. No, some cryptographers. No intersection. Uh, yes. So I'm not going to introduce them because I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. But uh, you probably know uh, most of them, if not all of them. So um, thank you the, for, to the five of you to, to be here. Um, we had this idea of uh, having all this day going uh, going through talks and, and learning about what the different uh, standard efforts are doing and so on. And we thought, you know, what, what is the best way to conclude the day? Well, we can't get everybody here to start working on standards because there is too little time and too many topics. So we thought, you know, let's have a, a conversation uh, and see what is the, what are the kind of hardest parts of, of creating a standard and so on. So um, without further ado, I'll just ask to have a couple of minutes each uh, to introduce yourself and Tell us a bit what's your encounter with uh, standardization and, and if you have any anecdote that you find is uh, worth uh, maybe bringing up. Um, you want to start? Sure. Okay. I'm, I'm Ugo Kravchik. Um, uh, yeah, I'm considered one with a lot of experience in standards. Um, I've been involved with, with the ITF uh, since uh, mid-90s. Um, I think uh, Ran, Ran told me that he was telling some anecdotes about me. So I don't know if you guys were there. And I, 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 I wasn't in his talk, so I don't know what version of anecdotes he told me. But in the 90s, it was very hard to work in the ITF for someone <coughs> that was talking about proofs and, 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 and definitions and stuff like that. Um, so it was not an easy time, but uh, I am a stubborn person and somehow, uh, yeah. And then the HMAC uh, came at a time in which MD5, it was st started breaking MD5 and uh, the, what's the name? Uh, Dobertin. Doberty, a German uh, researcher, that people here too young, but uh, he, he had the first words on uh, basically breaking or showing some weaknesses of MD5. And uh, so at the time that we were uh, trying to uh, promote HMAC, uh, uh, he, he came with his work and I, uh, I and, and so I sent him email saying, do you think that you can break HMAC with MD5 under your attacks? And he, the answer was, no, I have no idea. I don't think I can do that. So I asked him, can I send this to the IPsec mailing list? He said, yes. And I think that was the most important part in, <laughs> in getting this uh, accepted. Uh, but the reason I'm telling this is because actually the fact that there was a proof in HMAC became uh, you know, an, an, an important point in, in, in this history of trying really to move uh, crypto in practice, crypto practice into more theoretical or well-founded uh, um, yeah, science. Yeah. Uh, Ran did say that you were pushing for the security part of the, of the standard back then. Yeah, uh, he said that he mentioned uh, my friend uh, uh, Bill Simpson. Uh, I don't know if he, <laughs> uh, he has. He had the famous sentence saying uh, that he doesn't talk to self self-proclaimed cryptographers. So, anyway, that's about uh, anecdotes. So, hi, I'm uh, Dalia Malfi, uh, currently from uh, Calibra. Um, and um, I'm definitely not a cryptographer, so I think that means I'm a person. <laughs> <laughs> the anecdotes I have is actually why I am on this boundary between, so I have um, a long uh, interest, uh, more than a couple of decades in reliability and secure systems. So I'm kind of on the boundary, whenever there's a Byzantine failure, um, uh, I'm interested in it, and that means I'm touching on crypto. Cryptography, not cryptocurrency. <laughs> and I guess I have a, a, a series of life anecdotes that 
keeps dragging me into uh, the applied crypto, at least, or security side of things. So it starts with my postdoc. I joined at and Labs, and um, uh, Mike Reiter at the time, who came from Cornell, really wanted me uh, uh, to join, but he was working in a security group. So I joined the security group. I was the only non-applied cryptographer there. The only person. I'm sorry? The only person. person. The only person. <laughs> then uh, I assumed a faculty position at the Hebrew University after my postdoc. And again, as a distributed systems person, but there was nobody to teach the uh, intro to um, uh, cryptography and the advanced uh, course in cryptography at the time because Avi Wittgeson left for uh, sabbatical and uh, Michael Benar uh, was doing quantum computing at the time and Michael Rabin was spending all his time at Harvard. <laughs> so they asked me to teach the courses. So I had to teach uh, the security courses. And um, then while I was there, um, Noam Nissan, who is a you know, complexity theorist and later you know, the founder of uh, algorithmic game theory, nothing to do with cryptography, and me, nothing to do with cryptography either. Um, our daughters um, uh, took swimming lessons together. So we would sit by the pool, you know, Noam and I, watching them swimming and chatting about computer science. And at some point, they, um, the girls started pulling each other underwater. <laughs> and you know, Noam jumped and saved them and, and all of that. And somehow out of that came fair play, you know, the system that says, isn't it time to, to actually see if we can practically implement secure multi-party computation and just how expensive that is? So, um, so that's how I got into uh, that area. And I can continue, but this is, you know, this is uh, very personal, <laughs> my life story. I keep being dragged into the uh, topic. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks for sharing. <laughs> Uh, I'm Aran Tromer, I'm a professor of computer science at Tel Aviv University and a research scientist at Columbia University. Uh, let me share my origin story, how I got my powers. Uh, so Want a spider? <laughs> the, the crypto spider. So I used to be a person and then, um, so I was working, uh, well I was already on the slippery slope to become a cryptographer, working on uh, side channel attacks and cache attacks and such. And then I got wondering, there was this theory about zero knowledge proofs. Well, the kind of impossibility results for complexity, the lower bounds, wow, that's what's that good for? Well, maybe it's good for uh, proving the integrity of computation as it, it was envisioned before it became uh, a theoretical complexity theory tool. And maybe the kind of verifying integrity of computation that zero knowledge proofs can do can be a way to mitigate the attacks that we were studying. If you cannot trust the computing platform because of various physical attacks, maybe you can just make it prove to you that it operated correctly. And maybe you can actually implement this by building on the theoretical results. So, wow, that's kind of cool. So I was at MIT at the time. We took it to uh, the NSF. We submitted the proposal. And the response came back that, uh, nope, no way this will ever work. But you know what? If this ever did work, it would be kind of useful. So here are a few dollars, don't spend them all in one place. They had a sugar program for exploratory research. Uh, <coughs> keeps you just up, above the water. Uh, and we started working on that, and it actually started picking pace. Uh, um, I, then I teamed up with um, Alessandro Chiesa, my former student, and Eli Ben Sasson to actually use the cutting edge PCP techniques to build it uh, even further and to build some prototypes. One thing led to another and uh, we actually showed various ways by which new knowledge proofs can actually work. And we said, great, so now the problem is solved. The world is saved. Uh, we can go back to our bat cave or whatever and, and do uh, theoretical research because everybody will just pick up this zero knowledge and use it. Well, nothing happened in that regard. And so we started looking for applications ourselves and started reaching around and we heard about that new thing, Bitcoin, that sort of had privacy but didn't. And if we only use zero knowledge proofs, maybe we could make it have real privacy. So we teamed up with people working on that uh, and we published the zero cash paper, which was one of the first plausibly real world use applications of uh, zero knowledge proofs. And we said, okay, now surely everybody will use it and we can go back to, to the lab and do our stuff. 
uh, because blockchain, right? And that didn't happen either because no one knew what is that, what, what the way they called it, the moon math of zero knowledge proofs. How can you ever trust it? No one would ever use it. Bitcoin's good enough for us. So we had to roll up our sleeves and create a new company that, to actually do the engineering to deploy this. It became the Zcash cryptocurrency, uh, which is alive and well. And uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, other cryptocurrencies that forked off from this and many other projects that were inspired by it to use zero knowledge proofs in numerous other applications, whether blockchain or other. Uh, Daniel is from Kedit, a company that commercializes these applications in the enterprise context. Uh, for full disclosure, I advise them, uh, and there are many others. And uh, this is why I'm sitting here, because those zero knowledge proofs that were, you know, would never work, but if they did, might actually be useful, have become useful, have seen many applications, and we would like to make sure that they're using it right. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Luis Brandão. I guess if the time to talk is proportional to the experience, I'll have just a little bit of, of time. I'm, I, I haven't been around for that long. Uh, I finished my PhD in uh, 2016. As a, uh, as a cryptographer, I guess. <laughs> um, my, my core area is uh, secure to party computation. Um, as I was doing my PhD, I did, uh, I, I'm originally from Portugal, I did a, a PhD between uh, Lisbon, Portugal, and uh, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in the US, and while I was in the US, I, I had the opportunity to do a, a short summer visit at uh, NIST, and that's where I met uh, Rene, who, who I mostly work with now. Uh, we match very well in terms of interests uh, related to privacy. Uh, and while I was still doing my PhD, Rene came with a problem where uh, basically the government is trying to implement a system of uh, brokered identification where uh, it's going to make everything easier because you can have now citizens identifying to relying parties uh, with the help of identity providers, but because there's a privacy constraint uh, where the identity provider should not know where the, where the person is going to. Uh, the government is trying to solve that by putting uh, some entity in the middle that is going to mediate everything so that now the identity providers don't know where the, the citizens are going. And it's like we look at this, okay, sure, but who's the, who's the person in the middle? Uh, and it would be a government-controlled uh, entity. Uh, and so that would a ended up actually being quite a, an interesting uh, problem to look at from the perspective of privacy, where actually secure computation ended up providing quite an interesting uh, result showing that, okay, even if you have to have that, that person in the middle because of it's very well justified, you can actually make sure that it's not uh, going to learn anything about the transactions that are going to uh, happen. Um, anyway, this is uh, how I got connected to NIST and Rene, and then once I finished my, my PhD, I kind of... Uh, but NIST looks a nice place to uh, to try out, and so here I am for the for the past two years. Just to try maybe a little bit of anecdote, uh, this was just a few months ago, uh, and this just to mention something about. Uh, I mean, I think it's something always present, namely in conferences, the aspect of NIST. Like, should, oh, oh, you're working at NIST. Like, uh, are you one of the good guys or one of the bad guys? Interestingly, an interesting inter inter uh, interaction a few months ago at a conference in Europe, uh, you know, just coffee time, saying hello to people, and uh, I say hello to this person, and then kind of just showing the name, oh, and the person says to me, oh, you're at NIST, I'm so sorry for you. And I'm like, oh, really, why is that? Oh, because NIST sabotages standards, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, actually, I had a quite a, a quick answer. It just occurred to me to say, oh, well, then I, I, I guess I'm glad I'm there to make sure that doesn't uh, uh, happen anymore, or at least that I can help that not happen. So it does, it does feel to me that actually being at NIST is, a, is an interesting place to be to indeed um, bring in some uh, interest for privacy and really making sure that we're doing good standards. But of course, don't trust my words, but, uh, but that's what it is. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, and it does look like a very, as I was saying in the presentation earlier this morning, um, 
even though I may not have a, a, a large enough historical perspective of things, I do think I, I bring a fresh perspective for some things, and I, do, I really feel excited about uh, looking that this is the time where some of these things, what, what we're calling advanced cryptography, is, is coming about in terms of standardization, so it's a, it's a cool time to, to be here. All right. So my name is Tanja Lange from the University, Technik University in Eindhoven. Um, unlike my co-speakers, I don't know why I'm here, but since I have the word anyway, I might tell some anecdotes. So growing up in Europe in cryptography, um, we've always been looking at the standards, i.e. NIST slash NSA standards as something which is probably there in order to be against us. So we've been always looking at those things as something where, okay, figure out what it's like. We, we always knew that we were a little bit paranoid, but well, it was not the good feeling, hey, this is something standardized, so it's good. It was more like, hmm, are they trying to shove something down our throats which is helping them spy on us? Well, and then some years later, Snowden came around, and well, at least there were some which were made to be, well, looking, well, not in order to make us more secure, but in order to make it possible for them, whoever they, them are, to look at what we're doing and get information that we're not supposed to do. Now, my first step at that point was do a lot of archaeology, so I spent a long time digging through all the FOIA requests about dual EC, so if you want to learn more about the history, how it was possible that these things happened. Um, if you saw the Project Bull Run releases, then there's like the NSA bragging about an exercise in finesse, and you go like, yeah, okay, fine, show me what it is. I mean, this is their annual report, and when you tell your boss, hey, I did well, please give me a raise, you will also say, hey, it was an exercise in finesse. Well, it actually was, now digging through all the details, is that the way that these standards work, and in particular the thing at ISO, is <sighs> somebody has to write this document. And then, magic, somebody is willing to take it over and do all the work. And so what happened at that point was that the US representative said, well, look, you just got another 40 pages of feedback with lots of nitpicky remarks, and the Germans don't like this definition, and the French and the British, and they're all complaining. How about this? Here is our new and shiny and nicely written, and we already did the work of formatting it the right way in ISO style, which is not the way you would write your things, but it looks like ISO style. How about this? And everybody said, oh, yeah, sure. That's an exercise in finesse. Just preying on the laziness of people. Okay, so it was a little funny. I could give some talks about it. I could show how this is a backdoor. We showed how the backdoor could be exploited in, in real life because the director of the NSA was going like, well, I'll buy you a beer if you can show that this actually is usable. Uh, he never followed up on that. But then, it's fun, but it doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't make the world safer. And so eventually it was like, fine, I probably have to roll up my sleeves and actually go to those meetings. And yep, it's still the same. If anybody is willing to do something, they get a shitload of work. So, well, please join and help so that the next standards are better. And uh, please join only if your name tag doesn't say NSA or, no, that, you can't say that, but um, we need more eyes on this. We need more people who actually have the background because normally people who have time to go to standardization bodies, I don't really have time to go there and I can't go to all of them. And it's so easy to slip some. And when you look at ISO, for instance, I've now been to ISO meetings, there are now a bunch of cryptographers in the room at the SC27, well, JDC1, SC27 Working Group 2, which is meant to be the one for doing crypto standards. And there's a good number of people with different interests, and I'm happy to see the NSA there, and happy to see the Russians there, and the Chinese, and so on, and a whole bunch of free world cryptographers, and we're all keeping each other in check and reviewing things. But even this one working group, there is a huge flood of documents. I can't possibly keep up on all of them. Maybe together we can. But then there are other ISO working groups. So there is the ISO working group on financial standards. So the financial system has their own crypto things. There is something on small devices. There is something on this and this and this. And it turns out that if your crypto cannot get into the SC27 working group two, you can just go to working group three. For instance, QKD, which several of us have some loathe against, didn't manage to get into working group two, and so now they're trying to get into working group three, which is actually there once there is a standard that they 
determine how to qualify and how to measure this? Well, they skip in the standard part and they just go into three and probably every customer will just say, oh, and ISO standardized, check, that's fine. So it's a huge time sink, but if each of us maybe does a little bit, we can do it. Now, the reason why I'm saying I have no idea why I'm on this panel is that my normal work is low-level crypto, trying to get signatures, encryption stuff right. I dabbled a little bit in higher-level protocols, have done some pairings and such, doing mostly post-quantum these days. Um, so I can't really help much with the fancy stuff. But then again, the lessons learned on being on those standardization meetings is probably similar to what we encounter elsewhere. And well, maybe if each of us does a little bit, it can work. So just to kind of address these points of, I don't know why I'm here. Like, I, I think you're, you really, find somebody you're else? really answering your own question. Like, we want to bring all these people from different walks of life, right? I think uh, Louis was, uh, sorry, Ran, Ran was mentioning this this morning that uh, it's important to bring, you know, people from theory, people from, from th that are developing, open source, uh, people from advanced cryptography, not advanced cryptography, people that work in standards, people that don't work in standards, and all, all walks of life in some sense. Um, but, but this also kind of brings me to, to think a bit in, in retroactively as, as to the difference that I at, at least see in, in some sense from uh, the past way of doing standardiz standardization, at least in cryptography, and the new way. And, and I think I want to ask you, like, uh, you know, wh why are standards important, uh, if at all, right? I mean, there is, in some instances where they may not be important, or they may be taken advantage of, and others that not. So if I ask you all that question, are standards important, and when are they important? You want us in order, or? Okay. If so if anybody wants to answer, please just answer. It depends. So I would say if you need something where multiple people do something, it has to be interoperable, it helps to have a standard. If you just need something for yourself, for your own product, be it open source software, be it commercial product, um, and you have the expertise to select something, you don't actually need a standard. And standards will get in your way in the sense of speed of product development, whatever. There is another place where standards can help, namely if you want to have some certification or some form of verification at the end of it. Uh, there are a bunch of companies which are well set up to test things that are in the standards. And if something is a newfangled protocol or newfangled cryptographic primitive, they don't have the expertise. I'm not saying that all of those things help, or, well, I think they help. I'm not saying that all of those things work. We have seen, for instance, OpenSSL, FIPS certified, had a SEC fault in something which should have been tested and working, but there were probably other things that were caught in the certification. So some things it helps, and some other things, well, couldn't be bothered. Uh, I guess uh, maybe as a compliment, uh, I think a standard is a, a reference that people can uh, refer to. And uh, in good use cases, there's, there will certainly be bad use cases as well, but in, in uh, good use cases, they can potentially serve to, to be a reference for best practices. So for example, picking the example of uh, uh, threshold schemes for cryptographic primitives, where one of the goals is to have a way of uh, enhancing certain security properties, such as, for example, uh, uh, better resilience against key leakage. So if there are scenarios where it's likely that a key is under attack, there's some adversary trying to reach a key, then maybe at some point in the development of these schemes, one can say, okay, maybe some threshold schemes would be a best practice to protect uh, high value target keys. Uh, and so once we have that reference, that's a reference of comparison. If somebody loses a key and was not using that, maybe it's an indicator, well, it should have been using that, possibly. Uh, another uh, thing that I think can be a benefit, maybe it's a secondary benefit, but I think it's also relevant, uh, related to Samuel's conversation, uh, uh, talk today, is a standard may also indeed constitute a period of uh, higher peer review of a particular uh, method or operation, and uh, it will probably lead to a better specification of a particular technique, and that may have its own benefit, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, in general, things, uh, products that 
that different manufacturers, companies uh, generate and they need to in uh, work with each other require standards. So in the case of cryptography, uh, mo most cryptography really requires standard in that sense because you don't want just one company to be able to produce the products, uh, you, you, you want different vendors and to interoperate. So in that sense, there is this operational reason for for, for standards, uh, but uh, beyond that, in cryptography, we want to educate the world not to invent their own crypto, because this usually doesn't work well. And if you don't want these companies to invent their own crypto, you need to give them the, the solutions, and this is one fundamental reason for, for standards in this, in this area. Um, and then there is the question of best, the issue of best practices, uh, which is also somehow determined by the standards. I'm not saying that all standards uh, actually standardize on the best practices. So this is not necessarily the case. Uh, but uh, if we want this to be the case, we can help by being uh, involved with these things. Uh, one, one example of uh, best practices that uh, so. Best practices also in this area are important for regulations. So, you know, when we people have regulations on privacy or uh, uh, security-related stuff, then the standards also are a guide for, for regulators. And I always, you know, now uh, people work on search and encrypted data, for example, and there are different uh, methods. One, one of them for range queries is deterministic uh, um, order preserving encryption, which is deterministic encryption and therefore not a great encryption. Uh, so the question is when, when, a, when a regulation or a law says that data needs to be encrypted, it doesn't say it needs to be encrypted with semantic security, right? So uh, the, the word encrypted is, is, is not sufficiently descriptive um, if, if, if there is a standard to cite with, in relation to that, then, then you get a much more, uh, uh, more, more information on what really is needed or meant. I think another consideration is uh, lowering the barriers to adoption, especially for technology that's as new as some of the things we are dealing with here, um, where knowledge is not yet ubiquitous for anyone to just pick it up and do it in-house. Then we need standards for the same rope that we put guiding grays and handholds on the hiking trails, right? They may save some experienced hikers from falling to their death, but also they will encourage less experienced hikers to take the trail in the first place. And uh, as with um, the very complex and nuanced um, cryptographic primitives that we are dealing with here, um, there are many people who are cognizant of the dangers of doing it wrong, and so will only uh, start the hike if um, they feel that it's well marked, uh, and others that we will save from certain death um, if they try to just um, wing it. Um, and uh, I think this discussion is important because it shows that there are different considerations for the different phases of the evolution of the standards. Um, in the initial ones, uh, where we are, uh, the informational aspect is crucial, whereas later on it's the normative one that's essential for interoperability that I, I believe takes over. So maybe if, if I can just kind of follow up on that, it's a great, it's a great point for the next question, but also like when you mean um, lower the barriers for adoption, it's also in some sense lower the barriers for entry, right? Uh, the fact that uh, when you can give this tool or the, a standard to someone that is not, uh, doesn't have the money to implement this stuff, maybe we can just take the standard and implement it without having to go through a long process, right? But um, so in terms of adoption, right, um, we have this kind of question of, or, or this tension, I would say, where um, in some cases technology is just being adopted by companies, and that's when sometimes the motivation to create a standard comes into place. In other cases, you have right, a open source, for example, projects that sort of create an ad hoc standard, right? So what really goes first, like a standard or adoption, right? This is, I think, a question uh, that, that may resonate with some of you. So, uh, again, I have the least uh, uh, say here, the least stake, the least experience, perhaps. Uh, I've never actually participated in the standardizing effort. I don't think everybody uh, else did. Not sure. Uh, but I do want to say, um, um, 
one of the advantages, but also uh, where I would see a need for um, uh, you know, so some drawbacks or so some cons uh, for this uh, um, standardization is, um, you know, we're, we're fundamentally, I agree with everything that's uh, said here. We're dealing with a f advanced crypto methods that uh, fundamentally are addressing um, decentralized trust. So bringing distrusting parties to automate the processes and the interaction between them. So how can I bring somebody that doesn't trust me uh, if we don't even agree on the formats or the standards or the uh, primitives? Uh, clearly there's uh, that need. There's also a need to uh, consider the societal impact of the technology that we create. Um, and if you just let open source, uh, ad hoc, or even products um, uh, create facts, you know, in ad hoc uh, standards, uh, you might not have the responsibility and uh, the protection of regulatory oversight um, and generally, you know, even economist uh, or, or legal uh, uh, advice as to uh, how to best uh, create technology that uh, we can be accountable for and that takes into uh, considerations all these aspects. Related to that is the issue of transparency. Uh, that's one of the things that you want to, to guarantee or provi provide as much as you can. Uh, we, we, we have examples of NIST is a perfect uh, case of extreme non-transparency and extreme transparency. The non-transparency with the famous uh, uh, pseudo-random generator uh, and and great transparency in all these competitions, uh, AES and uh, hash and now uh, post-quantum and all this stuff that is very open and... So you mean uh, the period of NIST pre-Lewis and post-Lewis? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, uh, I think that uh, when AES started, uh, Lu uh, Lewis was in high school or something like that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah, anyway, in, in general, the issue of transparency and, w in, and uh, even in cases where standards are developed in some chaotic way, but with transparency, that's, that's already some level of, of assurance. No guarantee of something great, but uh, at least assurance that uh, th things were put on, on the table. So I think guidance is wonderful and definitely desirable. But when I think of standard, I think of something which is unique. There's the standard for doing something. Whereas when I hear guidance or something new, then I think, okay, fine. A, it doesn't mean that we have selected which of those. It's just like everybody who does something should also give guidance on how to implement it properly and how to take into account whatever considerations belong to this protocol. But that, to me, is not a standard. Um, Hugo, since you just mentioned the... the uh, so run number generator. I mean, that's the one where the dual EC is in. This was, in some sense, an open process. They had two conferences where people could give feedback, but it was not a competition. It was something where NIST posted this thing as they post, I don't know, 20 or 30 things per year, send them, and you can be on the mailing list, you get a notification, hey, there is a draft, please comment on it. But to me, this is more like a denial of service attack. I don't have time to look at all of those, and so in the end I go like, yep, fine. And the same happens with ISO, the same happens with ITF. There's too many things, and if we now say we want to have even more standards, that means we're spreading even more thinly. And so that's why I'm thinking, let's hold back on things, let's do f community focus on a few things that we can actually handle. And I'm happy to see NIST doing post quantum I'm happy to see NIST doing lightweight, I'm happy to see NIST doing uh, advanced crypto, but does NIST and does the community actually have enough manpower or cryptographer person power um, to handle all of those, or are we losing focus on things? And yes, I do see that you would like to have some advanced things. It would be nice to have a standard on zero knowledge, but you also want other people to, to have reviewed it. And where do they come from? Because they're currently busy with the other standards. So on the question of when time is ripe to start standardizing, um, and it should be even standardized before there's adoption, 
Well, first, sometimes, yes, for example, with post-quantum, there is no substantial adoption of post-quantum cryptography, but we all understand that it needs to have an ASAP and it needs to be highly interoperable. Uh, but even for things that are much fuzzier, like zero-knowledge proofs, um, it, um, while it's definitely too early to have normative standards for specific algorithms that everyone should use, there are already fragments that are very useful to standardize, uh, like uh, interoperability at lower levels of the stack, uh, the benchmarks, conventions, and terminology, uh, because they enable the conversation. Uh, and they, uh, even this conversation is useful for the practitioners who can already use these components. Crucially, it's also useful for the researchers in academia who are building these components, because they can talk to each other more effectively, they can fairly compare things in their performance using common conventions for benchmarking. And often the conversation also raises new research problems. For example, the work that Ryan Canetti presented earlier about UC modeling uh, emerged from the first uh, ZK proof standardization workshop and the need recognized there to better capture these properties. Um, so I think um, we should not overreach and not become rigid and it's too soon uh, or aim to uh, um, solve the very difficult problem of whose scheme is best, but we should look for the places where meaningful impact can be made. Do you feel like um, uh, early or not too early, um, there's uh, a sense in which uh, standardization conflicts with specialization, optimization, as in you know, specialized solutions that are better suitable for perhaps uh, special purposes? There's certainly a conflict there, especially with very rich functionality, where, for example, performance depends drastically on the application domain. Um, the approach that we're taking to this in the ZK proof standardization effort at this point is a descriptive rather than prescriptive one. We are trying to comprehensively describe the different approaches and the main trade-offs uh, to help practitioners place themselves in the large engineering landscape of possible approaches. Uh, I, assume that this will eventually converge into uh, a smaller, distilled uh, choice of concrete algorithms and parameter choices. Okay, I think that we just have a different idea of what, standardiz of what standardization means. To me, it's like a standardization body says something, whereas what you're saying is the community working on this gets together and comes up with, hey, how do we decide to write these things down? And it's not a selection of an algorithm, it's the selection of a presentation way of the evaluation way and so on but that's um, this is the component that I stress so far mm -hmm. uh, it certainly goes beyond that for example uh, in the ZK proof uh, security track that deals with algorithms and security definitions there is a, an ever-evolving survey of the specific algorithms and approaches um, but not not just the conventions used to designate them in the implementation part, there is a detailed discussion of the, the modules and uh, best practices for implementations and an evolving uh, taxonomy of existing implementations and their properties. Um, so there's um, a lot to do that uh, is just at, the, at this descriptive level and, and yet is substantial. So, I, uh, <laughs> um. So one note that I think addresses what uh, Tanya was saying with respect to the denial of service problem, which I, I think it's a, it's a real problem, and, and the aspect of the of the right time for standardization. I think uh, uh, another element that we can look at is not necessarily whether it's the right time to standardize, but whether it's the right time to have a standardization process. And so then we can what we can tune is the speed at which the process goes. And so I think if we, we, if we realize that we have a, a potential for denial of service because there's not a lot of people, we can potentially go slower until we actually, I mean, whoever's leading a, a standardization effort can, can be aware of that and can make sure, look, guys, we're only going to advance if we actually have collaboration. So at least from the, the perspective of uh, uh, we, I mean, the privacy enhancing cryptography team is having uh, at NIST now with respect, let's say, with, with zero knowledge proofs, uh, is that we're emphasizing this aspect of developing reference material. 
uh, and, and positioning, I mean, we even put it as a disclaimer when we made our uh, initial comments that we're not, this doesn't mean an endorsement for standards, was really because we feel that that process is important. So the process of building reference material is a time during which we are getting informed, we're also putting our contribution. And so I think that aspect of speed, not only of, so basically not looking at a particular time for standardization, F f to act to have a standard, but a time to have the standardization process, I think that uh, gives us more flexibility to have a more secure process. I'd like to add one more point about this. Uh, here's a concrete example. Um, right now, there is uh, a call for proposals by DARPA for the SIF program for uh, building zero knowledge proof systems. Uh, it's going to be funded by many tens of millions of dollars and consists of multiple teams constructed into several tiers. And there's TA1, which deals with the specific applications for zero knowledge, and TA2, that deals with creating the backends that actually runs the, the zero knowledge protocols. And here's the thing. There will be performers, uh, dozens of researchers, funded by DARPA, and some will be building these applications, and some will be building these backends, and they need to talk to each other. And some groups, most of them probably, will be being will only be building the higher part or the lower part. So how do we make any of these talk to any of those? Right, so this is essential for a project that the US government has deemed essential for national security. Um, and it requires, yes, some form of standards. Um, and specifically for these um, and similar applications, we're developing the ZK interface standard as part of the ZK proof standardization effort that aims to make, um, to achieve interoperability at the level of uh, conveying the statements to be proven in zero knowledge between the application layer and the cryptographic layer. Um, so we are seeing this kind of concrete engineering needs already at this very early deployment, even research stage. Thank you. So um, maybe I want to even take a, <coughs> a bit of a step back when, when both of you were also answering at the beginning of this class question. You were mentioning a lot this idea of, of uh, right, as a responsibility and accountability and transparency. And I think maybe even going back to what Tanya was also saying before, um, this idea that there is uh, kind of very little involvement from academia because usually or traditionally industry has been driving the standards or standard bodies have been driving standards for industry. But now we're kind of seeing, and, and I hope that this is the case, that Maybe standards is a way to bridge uh, academia and industry, right? And this is a way to bring accountability because there is sort of inherently different interests from both both sides. Um, so my question, I guess, is is twofold. One is, uh, is standardization the only way to bridge academia and, and industry? Um, and the other question is is more on the lines of. Um, I guess what is what is the best what is the better way to standardize through standard bodies or through community efforts, right? So, um, yeah. well, I I think that, that yeah, there are many ways, different ways of uh, having uh, uh, this, you know community efforts, the industry, academia, uh, partnerships, uh, standards one, one, one way. Um, it uh, depends a lot uh, on, on w whether the, the interests of the academia uh, and of the industry align and they happen at the same time. Uh, when I, I mentioned the mid-90s when you know, when I was working in the ITF, there are very, very few cryptographers involved with that, even though things were, very important things were happening because, you know, the things that happened at the beginning, it's very hard to, hard to change them later. Uh, but there was no awareness uh, in the academic community that actually, uh, you know, they, 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 something is happening in the world and, and we are not participating. Uh, so definitely standards is one, one way of doing it, depends on, in, on the type of standards, some standards that no academician will be able to work uh, because they are boring and they are bureaucratic and they are closed and uh, you need to be a member, so, so there are different uh, constellations. 
that uh, and, and right now, uh, I mean, w when these things happen together, this is the best. Now, in, in the last years, we saw for the development of TLS 1.3, I mean, an amazing uh, you know, joint work of, uh, of the industry, of the experts and TLS from the industry side, and uh, cryptographers and security people and formal uh, methods people, I mean, really a huge uh, collaboration that hopefully <laughs> ended in a, in a good protocol, we'll see, in the, in the years to come. But the, the truth is that there is very good uh, track record that when cryptography is done uh, with proofs and uh, by uh, uh, professional cryptographers, the result, I'm, I'm not saying that they will be perfect, but uh, they, they stand time ma ma much better. Um, yeah, so again, I, I won't say that there is one model that always works better than the others, uh, but uh, the, the, the point is that the, the, the li weakest link are, the, are us, the researchers, because we like to work only on what we like to work, and if something re requires too much uh, involvement with details and stuff like that, then uh, many of us we will not do that. Uh, so it's really a responsibility on, on our side. I mean, we, we cannot wait for the industry to come and say, please, please help us. Uh, this is a, a very, very important point, right? I mean, I don't want to stop anybody else from answering the, the question, but how do we incentivize researchers, right? Cryptographers to be in these things? Uh, this is kind of going back to what are the, the different I interests? Very, I have a very pragmatic answer to this. So to to support what Hugo uh, was saying. Look, uh, do you know of anybody, of anybody who made tenure because of their contribution to the standards committee? Um, there's just academia uh, okay, traditionally does not have the recognition or the resources to invest in uh, this really, really important, noble, holy uh, work. And it's not a work of uh, you know one month. It's a lot, a lot of uh, uh, investment, time investment, uh, and um, it is grudge work and talking to people and things that uh, scientists are not motivated to do. And the reason you're uh, now seeing uh, you know some convergence is because academia is becoming much, much more industry uh, friendly. Anyway, everybody's doing startups. Everybody has business uh, incentives. So now there is. Um, the resources and the, the incentives, uh, there are the resources and the uh, incentives, uh, both on advanced, you know, prominent scientists to participate in this work. But my pragmatic answer is, unless you have the uh, business reward and credit to do that, you're not gonna force anybody. So uh, I think that definitely, uh, historically, people got a lot of credit. Uh, I mean, the, the, the Rindel guys, the AS guys, uh, the Shastri guys, uh, uh, Don Coppersmith uh, doing uh, the DS. Uh, I mean, in they, industry, they, they, they were all uh, industrial researchers. They I, were not. I, I can uh, tell you that Don Coppersmith would have had the tenure in, in any university. Because uh, sure, but I mean, the academic system huh? is not the academic system is not set up to reward you for wasting your time on standards. Well, I don't they, have they, money to they, go. I don't have time to go. It's against publications. Well, so, I mean, I, I'm doing it because for the good of the world, but I'm a total idiot for doing it. So, so um, I, I think that when you say I talk about working standards and when I say talking, working standards, I think we have a different, uh, different uh, feeling about this. I wrote many papers thanks to my involvement with standards. Because what was the standard? It's not that uh, people were defining things and I was documenting them. You know, it's, it's, we, are, we are talking about cryptography. We are talking about developing cryptography, inventing, uh, uh, defining, proving. So this is part of our uh, research work. Uh, it's true that you have to spend time interacting with the engineers, interacting with industry, which I usually find painful on one hand, but also very, a, a, a great educational uh, experience and a great source of problems to, to work and to publish papers on. So it's, um, I think there's one big difference between what I'm talking about and what you're talking about. You're talking about standardizing your own algorithms. 
So you're mentioning AES, right. you mentioned SARS-3. So you have an inherent motivation to see these things getting used. And yes, then it's totally worthwhile to invest a little bit extra or a large bit extra to push this into standardization bodies. You're motivated to go for the d year or two years while this is in discussion. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about is that there are a lot of standards which are being written, which are being pushed by industry for their own interest, and they have the same idea, hey, look, we have this thing, one of our designers did this, we now would like to have a stamp of approval of yeah. ITF, ISO, Etsy, what have you or not. And spending time on reviewing and cleaning up the mess that is there, that is not very rewarding. But it's also necessary to do because we see those things getting used in products. Mm -hmm. And if you were yesterday at WAC, every single paper was showing a really fatal flaw in real world deployed things and essentially everything was based on the standard where the standard was just flawed. Because we as a community don't have enough time to review all of those. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm not talking about AES or SHA-3. That was lots of community involved. I'm talking about all these other things which fly by and say, hey, do you want to give a comment on this proposed standard? I, I very much agree with that. And we're seeing that not just in the heavyweight ISO processes, but also in the community-driven ones where um, a lot of the effort is a bit of like uh, a potluck party. Everybody comes along with their thoughts and pet peeves, and you need to somehow coalesce all of these together into something coherent. Uh, and the most effective way is to um, leverage those pet peeves into, you know what, if you're so pissed about that, why don't you write that chapter? And it sometimes works. <laughs> Uh, often it doesn't. Uh, often they have the full intent to do it, but once they fly back and have their teaching obligations and their deadlines uh, and their grant reports, then um, the energy dissipates. Uh, and I think we're still learning the ropes of uh, how to create these skills out of people's spare time and best intentions. Uh, just a comment on standards. I, 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 I conceive that the, the notion of standard does include uh, the case where people want to standardize their own things uh, just for the sake of standardization, it becomes a reference. So I think the, where the issue may be is how do people recognize standards and uh, which standardization bodies with particular missions recognize particular standards. So this was actually a, a, a question posed in a previous uh, presentation where, uh, I mean, I, I posed this question about Okay, if maybe one of the benefits of standardization is that it goes under a, a, uh, a better peer review and better specification, okay, if that's the only thing that that standard is achieving, then if people know that, then it's not a problem. It's, it's basically a paper. Um, so to a certain extent, uh, I guess, depending on the application, sometimes what we need are actually meta standards, which are standards saying these are the approved standards. Uh, actually, to a certain extent, NIST does that in, in uh, particular settings. It says these are the particular standards that we accept for signatures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and that particular vendors need to use if they do business with the government, for example. Uh, so, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I, I felt this even while I was preparing the presentation for this workshop. The question of what is a standard comes uh, back and forth. And usually we're talking about standards and we have a an implicit mindset. Uh, so maybe sometimes it's better that we dis disambiguate uh, what we're talking about. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we're going. We spoke a lot about like the origins of standards, like where do ori where do standards originate? How? What is the best way to proceed with that? What are the incentives and so on? Now I want to ask, like, okay, now we assume that we have some standard. For example, um, there is this tension right, that we kind of are all aware, maybe maybe secretly aware, uh, that standards can somehow uh, stop innovation, right? So, right, companies can adopt some standard, they implement it, they put it in their product, they integrate it, and everything's good. And then, you know, a few years later, suddenly it's broken, or there is a better uh, standard, right? Are, are researchers motivated to look into this new, this direction when now there is a standard and you know that maybe it's not gonna be adopted? What's the tension here? How do we form standards so that we don't stop innovation, right? Are we talking about good standards or bad standards? 
which ones do you want to talk about? Well, I, I think the the quality of being good or bad can actually be a it's uh, it's a contextual property. It can change over time. I think I mean I think the answer can go both ways. So if we develop a good standard in a particular good point in time, that can promote adoption, can promote innovation, can be a good reference for people to do more uh, research and innovation along that line. Uh, now, if we have a context where compliance with a standard is required and um, the standard becomes obsolete and the standardization context is not able to revise the standard, retired, withdraw the standard, uh, or replace it by some, something else, then that's a problem. Again, I think uh, in a big part that may be a, an issue not with the standard because, in, I mean, in, at least in this use case, the standard may have been good when it was designed. It may be a problem with the structure of the, 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 that holds the standard. So let's say that, uh, yes, I think it's a great standard. It has it, it went through a good prog uh, a process. It's holding fine. Let's say that next year it's broken. Can we change it immediately? Uh, if we can't, then we have a problem, but is it because the standard was bad? Well, it was bad, now we know it, but previously it was a good standard. But, but correct me if I'm wrong, you're talking about more like the process, right? So there, on one hand, you have the process, on the other hand, you have the, the adoption part. So talking, for example, TLS, I think this could be a good example. A new standard was created for TLS 1.3, but how many companies or how many like, services adopted TLS 1.3 at this point? Uh, okay. TLS 1.3 is a special case in which the adoption is going very fast. Okay. Uh, that's that's ma mainly because once the browsers uh, support and on, on all the browsers, the vendors uh, adopted it very fast. So that's relatively fast. But uh, standards like TLS, I mean, th these that uh, are not uh, you know, a block cipher, I mean, not basic primitives, but protocols or, or uh, uh, modes of operations, this should be built in some flexible way so that at least the components of it can be, can be replaced. So that's a very important uh, consideration to have in mind when you develop a, a standard, uh, make, make it I mean, th there is a tension between making it uh, flexible and making it too flexible. <coughs> Standards that have too many options <coughs> have uh, problems of interoperability or, or complexity, and uh, so, so you need to find some balance. But definitely there needs to be an element of flexibility, agility, in which you can change the components. Anyway, uh, af when, when the standard is finalized, uh, the interest of the des of designers goes down, but the interest of the cryptanalysts go up, goes, goes up, right? Because now yeah. you can write a paper, I broke the LS 1.3, I broke the AES. Uh, so there is a... <laughs> There's a good tension. Yeah, it's like I, I want to say, I, I don't think anything can stop innovation. Good luck trying. Good. Uh, if anything, I've seen in my life a lot of standards, not just in cryptography, Cobra, Cobra in distributed computing, P4 in uh, you know, software defined networking, where the standard or um, sometimes it's just a de facto technology standard um, has some, let's say, limitations or constraints. And there's a whole ecosystem and uh, research uh, field born just uh, around dealing with the constraints that the technology has created and overcoming it. Yeah. Uh, if anything, I would be concerned about you know all this energy channeled at breaking or dealing with uh, the limitations of uh, some uh, some limited uh, standards. But I don't know if you can stop innovation. Nobody can. Well, I hope I hope we can't. Right? It's, um, so maybe maybe uh, a bit more uh, I don't know if technical question, but along these lines of of having a standard already set in place, like or. The question is really like, we're talking about advanced cryptographic standards, um, but really, to be honest, all these advanced cryptography actually uses, or use primitives that are not so advanced, or whatever we define as advanced, right? And what do we do with these standards, right? These are common, like if I put this specific example of threshold cryptography, homomorphic encryption, and zero knowledge, right? At some point or another, you're using some commitment scheme, or at points, you're gonna be using some signature, um, 
maybe not all of these are standardized. Are we too early standardizing advanced cryptography? And, and what do we do about these common primitives? Do we all standardize them individually for different applications? How, how do we deal with this stuff? So it, it does feel like, to some extent, we are jumping ahead by leaving some of the easier tasks behind. By we, I mean the human race, not we specifically. We are standardizing what we care about. But, um, there are many simpler primitives that uh, aren't fully standardized, things that are much better understood. In fact, uh, three years ago, uh, Nigel Smart and uh, several of his associates wrote a, a pointed letter to NIST um, asking for a more attention to standardization of uh, cryptographic tools that are pretty well understood. Um, for example, zero knowledge proofs, but not the fancy general ones that we're dealing with now, but rather things like uh, Sigma protocol for discrete log and Peterson commitments and the properties, uh, oblivious transfer, garbled circuits, this is a bit pushing it. Um, and these are things that have, uh, especially the first few, have converted nicely. They are building blocks in many existing protocols in industry, as well as the protocols that we are dealing with here. And it would have been nice to have those covered. Um. By the way, with the, with the soon-to-be approval of Add DSA, it essentially contains a, a ZKP of the script log mm -hmm. uh, embedded in it. Uh, just, just one thought. Um, so I think as we move further into the future, and assuming that we will be standardizing more generic SMPC, I think there will be a point indeed where it will make sense to have a good reference definition slash reference some something that we can reference if not uh, 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 an actual standard of some things like maybe garbled circuits or leave transfer some commitment schemes uh, but going immediately to those without knowing what is it that we're going to want to do with them um, might not be the best option if there's a possibility that when actually we go for the more advanced things then we actually need a little tweak of the commitment scheme. Now, having said this, I actually think that threshold cryptography is, is in a kind of a sweet spot in the following sense. It does require, for, let's say for the multi-party setting, it does require exercising some um, SMPC in certain cases. But the actual scope of threshold cryptography, I mean, if we look at it from the point of view of threshold schemes for approved cryptographic primitives, it actually has a very well-defined scope. So even though we might be looking at, uh, maybe we can call it a large number of, of uh, possible standardization elements, it still it, it, it comes down from a small number of primitives. Let's say we may want to do threshold RSA, threshold DCDSA, uh, threshold ADDSA, threshold Threshold post-quantum. Hmm? Threshold post-quantum. Post post -quantum. Post -quantum. Uh, although the post-quantum is still in the evaluations. <laughs> it may take a little bit more time. Uh, the point I wanted to make is the following. If we say that what we want, let's say, in the next one or two years is a threshold version of uh, uh, ECDSA or RSA keygen, and we know that we're going to have to use, let's say, an oblivious transfer there, then we're talking about one standard that is going to use one primitive. So maybe the actual exercise of doing the full standardization is what we need to actually define within that own standard one implementation of one, let's say, oblivious transfer. And I think that's a good exercise without having to commit that we're, we've standardized oblivious transfer because now when we go for the next, maybe more advanced SMPC protocol that also requires oblivious transfer, then we can analyze, okay, should, can we use the one that we already used? And then if we can, we can just refer to it. We can even, if we want at that point, actually remove it to a standalone document. But then we also retain the possibility of saying, you know what, for this, Primitive, it was a good exercise to have done that oblivious transfer, but now we want a slightly tweaked version. So I guess the summary of what I'm saying is, while we have um, a small scope where we're just going for one or two advanced concrete protocols, I don't see it as a big deal to actually embed in the standards the primitives that we're using. And then when we start defining three, four, or five advanced protocols, then we can, we can by then, we have learned with the experience. So, so one thought about it. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I, I want to kind of ask a, a bit of a orthogonal question, but I think it's a very interesting one where 
Um, going back to the tension between academia and industry and interests, uh, in the industry we have kind of a legal framework for, for processes and for applications and, and things that are already established, right? Almost trust models, but also like a legal punishment right? for, beha for, for malicious behavior, let's call it, right? So can we justify uh, the effort from, from, let's say, our side as researchers to right, uh, ensure or enforce non-malicious active behavior in these cryptographic protocols when we know that whenever there is going to be a cheater, there's going to be a kind of a breach of contract and legal consequence, right? And, and, and attached to this question is kind of the idea, so can standards kind of help um, de define regulatory and legal frameworks, right? You want to define standards for detection and for punishment? Right, so, so in some sense cryptography can enforce behavior or can catch be behavior, right? Uh, so put otherwise you're saying why even bother with a fully malicious model when we can assume that everybody is honest but curious because if they, are, if they behave maliciously they'll be thrown to jail. As long as they're caught. Exactly, and that's the answer, right? <laughs> so. Um, we have scenarios where people are not associated with robust identities and are not accountable in the standard uh, world of uh, legal enforcement. And maybe the clearest one is blockchain, right? You are uh, respecting transactions uh, that were posted by unknown people and uh, the only way to uh, make this work is by not assuming uh, that there is any recourse other than a cryptographic one to ensuring their correct behavior. Um, there are other scenarios where uh, there might be fallback alternatives using society's legacy ways of uh, enforcing correct behavior, but those are very expensive. Um, it's true that humanity has spent the, the last few, maybe tens of thousands of years building civilization, aka way to enforce norms, but uh, it has many costs it has in, 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 uh, in, in liberty, in uh, resources in uh, performance of, of these systems and to the extent that we can replace norms uh, enforced uh, the good old way with uh, real-time cryptographic protocols, often there is a benefit to that. And it's these places that I think are being monetized by uh, many of the names you'll see on the sponsored list of, of this workshop who are figuring out that uh, this can uh, just make their current processes work better with fewer assumptions. Um, one element, uh, I, I don't know if you meant, uh, but uh, one thing that you cannot expect is the judicial system to understand uh, cryptography. So to this date, uh, digital signatures, uh, you know, are still, uh, are, the judicial system has a problem dealing with them and accepting them and, uh, you know. Um, but not with forgeable paper signatures, right? I mean. Right, right. And word of gentleman is still better than uh, a, a zero knowledge proof or, 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 or explicit proof, full knowledge proof. So I think that there is an issue there, and which is, uh, anyway, this is the, the issue of regulations, right? It's a, it, it's a big deal. And uh, we, we have to work in that direction, even if it works very slowly, but uh, it's, it's a very important aspect. So. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, no, uh, Peter Van Vankerberg talked uh, uh, yesterday morning about uh, basic constitutional right of modern uh, society is uh, that unless you committed a crime, you will not get punished for it. So I think there's a very dangerous slippery slope in automated punishment systems and things like uh, social rating uh, mechanisms. Very slippery slope. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I do have uh, some concern with the premise of, of the question, which is, well, assuming that we can catch people and... Um, I mean, even if, you, even if we catch people misbehaving, that does not necessarily mean that uh, we can enforce some, uh, some punishment. And, uh, and I guess a full answer to the question would also have to be parameterized with what is the cost of being caught versus the cost of actually achieving whatever we were trying to, to get with the malicious behavior. But um, one ex two extra thoughts. Uh, one is one potential problem of uh, standardizing, let's say, semi-honest, secure, passively secure protocols that completely break down in an active, in a, 
with an active adversary is, is the problem of misuse. So now you have a protocol that is stamped. This has been zero-knowledge proof or SNPC in the semi-honest case. And then for the people who are not cryptographers, oh, we're using a secure system. Therefore, we can yep. just do whatever you want, right? So it's the, it's the problem of, of uh, the false sense of security. And I think the, I mean, in general, the problem of misuse of uh, protocols, of devices, and all of that, it's, it's a huge problem in, uh, in cryptography. So I would tend to say if we can do maliciously secure, uh, uh, actively secure or secure against uh, malicious adversaries, then I think we should go for it. At least in the SMPC arena, the, there has been a convergence with respect to the costs. Previously, it was like 40, let's say 40 times difference. And then in a lot of settings, those, the factor of difference has decreased a lot. Uh, just a final note is that at least in the SMPC area, we, we actually have, the, 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 I mean, a good characterization between semi-honest, malicious, and then we have the covert adversaries, uh, or the covert adversary model, where, which is actually, uh, uh, exactly measures the case where adversaries behave based on the probability that they can, they can be caught. And so- I, I wanna strongly agree, this goes back to the responsibility. Um, you know, we're fundamentally creating uh, very, very serious technologies here, and uh, if you give a false sense of security because we are experts, in probably what we created is secure. The responsibility and the accountability is on us. Mm -hmm. So we should aim for the uh, lowest denominator uh, such that mm -hmm. it's a foolproof uh, mm -hmm. use uh, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. I strongly mm -hmm. agree. But by the way, just one extra technicality in this, uh, I mean, it's but really- But by the way, here again is where I think societal scholars, you know, uh, lawyers, economists should be involved in the process, mm -hmm. not just us technologists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one technical aspect where it's kind of, uh, uh, it would be an analogous question to which I, I have more hesitation in answering, is the case of um, adaptive adversaries versus static adversaries, mm -hmm. where in uh, secure multiparty computation at least, there's a lot of cases where we, we can do the proof for static adversaries. We can't, we don't have the protocol for adaptive adversaries, but at the same time, we don't know of a real practical attack that would uh, uh, break down the system. And so in those cases, it's a little harder to say. Uh, and so I guess what I wanna say is, I would be inclined to accept a static, malicious, uh, so a protocol securing a static, malicious model, uh, if I don't know of any practical attack in an adaptive scenario, and I don't know any protocol that is efficient, at least in an adaptive scenario. Whereas for the semi-honest versus malicious case, it's a much easier answer, like go for the maliciously secure. Right, that's, a, that's um, because we know how to do that. Yeah. Right. I mean, uh, but it also boils down to what Aaron was saying before, that we need a lot of user guidance, that it's actually less important to have like the concrete scheme, but it's important to see to say on the annotations, what does this achieve, what do we expect, and what can you expect to come out of it? And, and many of the things are context, uh, uh, depend on the context and the application. So when you, you, when you build a primitive, that primitive can be used in many cases. In some of them, uh, being uh, non-adaptive can be okay, in some others can be a disaster, so. Yep. Okay, so. so um, I mean, we have more questions, but there's basically like 15, 20 minutes left, and I want to open it for, uh, for Q&A. So if you have any questions, uh, you want to come to one of the microphones and ask anything you're interested in hearing from the panelists? To ask one question, which is about formal methods, and um, how do you think this uh, technology may be used in uh, cryptography for standards, uh, whether is it uh, like usable right now for standardization uh, uh, processes, or is it, does it need to be uh, improved right now? Or? So, uh, Hugo already mentioned the, the role that formal methods played in the definition of TLS 1.3. I think that's a great achievement. Um, at the same time, what I, as a rather layman user, would like to see is that I can actually 
uses on things that I'm kind of prototyping or something. And so, um, yes, I think more has to happen, has to be easier for me to try it. But yes, please be involved. And you saw that the previous talk uh, with EasyCrypt being used on a, on a case. I think this is helpful. And if there are candidate solutions, it would be nice to get them formally verified mm -hmm. or shown to be not verifiable, in which <laughs> case they should be fixed. Mm -hmm. I, I think that the, it's, uh, the formal methods uh, analysis of uh, cryptography protocols have improved amazingly in the last years. And I don't think that there is any excuse to have something uh, a standard or, or, or an important component. Uh, there is no excuse not to, uh, to, to be analyzed through these uh, uh, tools. You know, I, I, I'm not sure about the completeness of these tools, but they are great debuggers. I mean, uh, again, TLS 1.3 is an excellent example where people have been working, running these tools, and you know, they found problems, they found issues, uh, they, they, they give you guidance on the design. So uh, I think that... Is there a standard uh, for programming? <laughs> no. Like a green single one? Uh, no, but... Uh, but we have a bootstrapping problem. Uh -huh. We have a bootstrapping problem here. Yeah. Bootstrapping <laughs> problem here. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, really, I think that uh, uh, we, we should be analyzing stuff as much as we can using the, these, these tools, which will keep improving. And, uh, so. Thank you. Thank you very much for this discussion. I found it really interesting, and I appreciated the balance of, um, say, like the positives of standards efforts and some of the things to be concerned with. So I guess I, I, I have to interrupt you and say that your talk, you know, the, the your UC, how do you call it? Saucy. Yeah, Saucy. Saucy. It's, it's an excellent example. I mean, it's not uh, uh, running the you know, automated tools, but really building stuff in a way that you can actually apply these tools or these, these formal logic. So, thank good. you. Thank you. Well, <laughs> no. he, he was running, he's, he was going to well, ask Well, just wait till what I was going to ask. And then to, I saw, I saw that. Okay. I, now yeah. I destroyed you. <laughs> totally derailed. Um, I, I, I have big, big questions kind of about how to, you, you know, know, like, what are the things to watch out for? Like, what would it mean for a standard to be bad or to go wrong? That there might be pitfalls to learn from. I, but I wanted to phrase it as a, a more, maybe hopefully interesting question. Like, do you have any horror stories or like anecdotes of standards gone wrong? Maybe like the second worst standard to the dual EC one um, that we might learn from as a counterexample? Every single talk yesterday at WEC. <laughs> Which one? Uh, WEC, the workshop yesterday, workshop on attacks oh. yeah. in crypto. Um, essentially everything was standardized and broken. So there was Bluetooth, there was WPA3, um, very new standard and also broken. So these are the, the, the last two talks that are in my head, but so everything many. before that as well. And what, what is there to learn from those though? Like is there? So some of those I would say are closed community, no feedback from the outside kind of standards. And I think this is kind of a warning flag for me by now. Um, it would be much more surprising to me if something which had gotten a lot of community feedback and review, I mean like, for instance, you mentioned formal methods, if there has been pieces, now with TLS 1.3, with all the praise, it's still not in one model as deep, everything together. So there still are some little cracks where things could go wrong, but I would be much more surprised with things like that going wrong than with something which was cobbled together uh, because somebody needed something and nobody ever looked at it. Clipper, Capstone, ring a bell? Anybody here uh, remembers? Uh, late uh, 90s, the government wanted to enforce encryption standard on uh, phone uh, transmissions uh, with uh, these two standards, Clipper and Capstone. Uh, including chip manufacturing, it was broken within less than, I don't know, 60 days. Matt Blaze, among other people at AT&T Labs, uh, showed how to break that. But basically, this was supposed to be the only way you encrypt uh, audio, uh, uh, you know, audio signal transmission uh, by a government standard. And luckily, cryptographer or cryptanalyst in this case 
broke it, so he kind of died a uh, peaceful and silent death. But that was a horror. I think another cesspool of horrible standards is blockchain. Uh, what we have is uh, many blockchain-ish projects out there who are building what are de facto standards because they are um, actually executed by interoperable network consisting of many thousands of nodes. So they may not use the S word, but that's what they're building. And somehow they think it's fine to do so without even having a specification for, for their protocol, let alone any form of analysis or review process. And because it's ternary rather than binary, then it must be fine. <laughs> True example. Oops. Toyota. Um, so uh, if there's one thing that uh, we need to uh, stomp out is this uh, um, the, the, the comfort that those fractions of the cryptographic community broadly construed uh, have with just putting random bit operations together or some field elements and group elements because they kind of type match or you can typecast them and then they type match and uh, calling this a cryptographic protocol that people are actually entrusting with many millions, perhaps billions of dollars. This is the elephant in the room, right? Uh, some of these people are probably fine, but uh, many of our colleagues uh, uh, or colleagues, or those who could have been our colleagues are actually out there right now doing very evil stuff. Do you uh, think knowingly or by incompetence? I mean, do you think malicious or just they cobbling it together with the best intentions and just don't get it right? I think most of these are incompetence or uh, the very closely related uh, meeting the deadline and not bothering with the advice they got sure. to actually write Overconfident. By the way, I, I, I wouldn't call this standard. By the way, I, I was thinking during this discussion that we should standardize on the notion of standard. <laughs> because I think that w one thing that we don't necessarily agree here is what, what that standard means. So, but so it, it's a philosophical uh, problem, but you know, we yeah, don't have to get metaphysical. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, but anyway, it, it, this is an example in which I, I, I don't see why you call it standard. You know? Well, if you're so pissed, then why don't you write that chapter? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so since you asked the question, like, how can you recognize a bad standard? What does it smell like? So find some standardization body where the membership fees are high, the access fees are high, and the, uh, they charge for attending meetings. I you if you take all three of those, it's and, fairly and likely not gotten any review. And they randomly pick people from different countries. You can embellish this, yes. Yeah, um, this, I wanted to, you, you use the term bad or good, I would like you to look at standard as something living with a life cycle, as any asset in the enterprise, it has got a life cycle, and one thing that I would recommend in any of your work is put a version, it's, you consider it as a, a block or an asset, you know, cryptographic uh, thinking or uh, model of, a, of, of the world, put it a version to it and look at it. Uh, my, my experience is 25 years of uh, running crypto services. I don't build them, I use them. And I have to replace asset number 1.1 to asset number 1.2 with asset number 1.3. And, and that's what I, I do as a leader. So uh, try to think of it as is, as a, yes, you have a very good tool as a version 2019. And, and but uh, 20 years I'll have to replace it, I'm sorry. So uh, please uh, look at it as uh, something that is a living architecture that uh, we have to maintain in one or two generations. Thank you. Yeah, definitely a very, very good point. Um, and, and is the, the issue of really uh, of agility and flexibility uh, that that we need to to put into uh, these things uh, fr from the beginning. In, in some way, the fact that things like zero knowledge are not mature enough really to be a standard maybe it has an up, uh, an, an advantage because we, we, you are less likely to you know to, to put something very. Uh, 
uh, they're hard coded into I into the, the standard. It, it already already has a version 0 0.1. <laughs> it didn't reach one. This agility is also proving useful for the research uh, that will lead to the consolidation of the standard. Uh, for example, it allows us to plug and play with different approaches to schemes and compare them uh, in terms of performance because uh, it was built in the first place to allow you to change the backend in a very convenient way, even if it uses a different representation. That is the ideal that we're striving for uh, that ZK interface makes some headway towards. Um, so to the extent that standards are in intended to uh, foster this competition and collaboration and putting the TA1 with the TA2 that I discussed earlier, uh, that plays very well also with the um, uh, fluidity and agility that come later on. Th thank you all. So um, before, before kind of wrapping it up completely, I just wanted to kind of say a couple of conclusions that I got from this and, and thank you all for, for sharing your experience and your views. Um, it seems like, you know, cryptography is still at a very early stage, right? Like uh, uh, we really started, I don't know, 50 years ago, right? Uh, 60 years ago or something with computers and, and advanced uh, in some sense. And now we're at a point where we see that really academics are getting more involved with industry, whether it's because the industry is asking for it or because there is more incentives in the industry than there is in academia, um, right? And hopefully now we're gonna see this trend where uh, adoption is done in the right way, right? Like, if you think about how, like, I don't know, physics and engineering, uh, right, came up to be and, and how it transferred, knowledge transferred from academia to the industry, right? Uh, people wouldn't have thought to, to put people into a rocket and shoot them out of space if it wasn't with the proper set of uh, physicists and validation of techniques, right? Uh, this is kind of the analogy that we need to get to, uh, that we wouldn't deploy secure systems where billions of dollars are based on without the correct processes and correct ver validations. Um, so in this sense, uh, I guess either we need to change the incentives that exist in academia, or we need to make sure that, r that the industry can counter that by, by asking and, and providing those incentives, right? Um, so in general, I would just say if, uh, if you're in the industry and you're building something, then make sure you involve academics. And if you're in the academia and you want to standardize, standardize something because you think it's useful, make sure it's useful before, right? Uh, it kind of goes both ways. So. Um, yeah, if there is any more questions, otherwise, uh, any more comments on your end? Maybe some conclusion remarks that you also want to share? So maybe let's uh, thank the speakers and the panelists.